So we're here this morning and we have Mads and it just says, I'm not even going to attempt a second name. So Mads hails from Copenhagen in Denmark, that beautiful city. And of course, I'm joined by my cohort here, Daniel Paulson from Sweden. And we're going to talk all things health. And uh, yeah, there's a few questions I have in my mind. I think this is going to be an interesting conversation. Um, I always say that, but uh, let's see how this one unfolds and to keep you interested. Mads has written a book. It's called Human Mechanics. It was published uh, about two months ago. So that's about May 2022. And the book is doing well. And uh, welcome, Mads. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. so much for having me here. And before we kick off, you're quite young, Mads. How are you involved in, in quite a, I would say it's a complicated field. I went down the breathing route because I could yeah. stick to one thing. You've kind of taken on a number of different things. So tell us a bit about you. Yeah, so I, I, I started down the, the physical trainer road. So where you are in the breathing field, I was in the physical training field. So, um, and that was really where I was based, was doing a lot of biomechanical works. And I, I, I pretty quickly got into the uh, sports fields um, where I'm basing my, my training and my clients are primarily athletes. So, but, but what I saw was that I couldn't affect them uh, sufficiently enough by only providing them with physical training, with biomechanical enhancing tools. We had to go deeper than that. And then that was when I actually wrote some of your books. Um, I learned a lot from, from those. And we kind of incorporated, incorporated the breathing stuff, which made a huge difference. So, so now we had the two aspects of biomechanics and breathing to kind of form them and, and, and make them better athletes. But I, I still thought that we missed something. So I began studying uh, nutrition, neuroscience, sleep and circadian rhythm and all these things to put some more things into the perspective to create the better human being. And, and yeah, that's really the road that I'm down at now. So I'm, I'm trying to learn as much as possible about the human being so I can, so I can solve problems better. And that's really what it's all about. And most people who have qualified in the same area as you, you're saying it's physical therapy? Yeah. Or physiotherapy, it's similar? Yeah, it's physical training. But, and very much, it's all about functional movement. It's, it's about improving movement. And here's the question that I'm putting to you. Do you think that movement can be improved if breathing is overlooked? How important is breathing in terms of optimizing movement? I don't think we can improve movements uh, if we don't if we don't take take breathing into the picture. Only to, only to a very little degree, because we know that breathing affects our our core strength, our posture, the way we move, the way we feel, the way we think, and 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 the human body is not just flesh and blood that's moving around. We have the nervous system that's connected to the brain, so we have this this big holistic system. So breathing is indeed uh, like fifty percent of of movement well that's a large figure and in terms of the connection with breathing you're talking about core strength and it mm -hmm. seems that very often the emphasis is on the abs but you're saying it's not just about that we need to be going deeper so can you just go a little bit and the other thing about movement is when you talk about movement what do you mean is it a guy walking down is a guy running what sort of movement is it is it all movement it's all kinds of movement because everything is connected to our posture. So it's even if we are standing or if we are sitting or lying down, every kind of movement. And I'm sorry to ask so many questions here because yeah. I want to tease this out. If movement is dysfunctional, what are the risks? What are the, what are the risks? In terms of, are you, do you have increased risk of injury? Is it going to impact performance? Is it going to hold the athlete back? Will they be more susceptible to lower back pain and things like that? Pain, illness, physical dysfunction is, is really the root cause of so many things. 
So it's, it can be physical pain, it can be illness, it can be a, a mental, di mental disease or mental dis dysfunction. So, so movement is everything. And, um, and, 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 and back to the question that I remember you, you, you asked about uh, core strength. I believe that, that the contemporary world uh, 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 thinks too much about the abdominals as being the real core. But the real core is dominated by the breathing, the pelvic floor, and everything that is around the core of our pelvis. So, so, so that's that's maybe the biggest misunderstanding in, in this fitness culture is that we have to exercise the abs to get a better core function. But the core is really breathing. So if we don't incorporate breathing into our biomechanics, we can ne never get a better core strength. Could you could you explain that? How would you if you say you want a better core strength? Mm -hmm. So you have to because you always like you say you think about the outer layers. You think about you know doing sit ups or whatever. How, what would you say would be a, like um, what would you have to do in in a short, few short words with the diaphragm and outer uh, muscles as well to kind of encapsulate all that core strength? Yeah. So core strength is diaphragm functionality so we have to first phase is really to we have to get aware of how to activate and engage the diaphragm properly and and at least that's where i see the biggest misunderstanding i don't know about you patrick i would like to hear your uh, view on that as well because you are the breathing expert um, but a lot of people misunderstand abdominal breathing with diaphragmatic breathing but if we focus too much on the abdomen expanding, um, then we lose a lot of this core tension that we talked about. We lose a lot of the uh, tension in the pelvic floor, in the glutes, in the deep abdominals, uh, and then our posture gets out of balance. So I don't think that uh, a proper diaphragmatic breathing should be uh, isolated to the abdomen but rather to the rib cage, so just a little above the abdomen. I don't know about you, Patrick, but that's how I see it. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think it's uh, even if we just consider how we breathe. You know, the brain is sending a signal via the phrenic nerve to the diaphragm. The diaphragm mm -hmm. is moving downwards. You have the intercostals pulling outwards. So mm -hmm. you're, you're going to have movement on all four sides. And I think risk, Mads, the risk is that when people think about abdominal breathing and we, we often use these words, and I'm sure you might use them, and everybody uses them, but it's not specifically just abdominal breathing, but we want movement on all four sides, and especially lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs, down around the eight and the ninth. And in terms of the, the risk that when we talk about belly breathing is that people will be actively pushing and pulling in their belly, irrespective mm -hmm. of their breathing. So, and the other thing is like, with such an emphasis on looking well, I think that's why, you know, having a six pack is, is seen to be that that's what it's all about. But individuals with a six pack ne might necessarily have actually good function of the diaphragm. Exactly. So the six pack is really dysfunctional because it's, it acts as this uh, 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 inhibiting shell on the rib cage and on the abdominal. So we're not uh, able to expand the diaphragm and thereby the rib cage to that degree that we want to expand it. So the rib cage, uh, oh, sorry, the, the six pack is one of the mo uh, most uh, misunderstanding uh, uh, dysfunctional concepts about physical training really. So, and you can get a six pack by, by, by correcting your breathing or by doing uh, other sorts of functional training that does not inhibit your diaphragmatic function. So, so uh, yeah. So how would you, how would you go about the, that from going from the inside out? Like, Daniel's looking for a six pack. He probably has one anyway. I should be, <laughs> yeah. I, I should yeah. be asking that <laughs> question, Mads. <laughs> but how, in your, in your experience, how do you work with that to kind of expand the rib cage and, and get that uh, breathing? Well, my my primary primarily uh, my primary focus when we work on the biomechanics and breathing part is to is to get as as big and as flexible a, a, a rib cage as possible. 
So, so my athletes are able in all situations to expand the rib cage and thereby the diaphragm uh, uh, to the biggest possible de degree. And if we want to do that without moving the abdomen, because when we are moving the abdomen, we're actually inhibiting their uh, uh, performance and their posture. And that's why when we, if you imagine the abdomen expanding, when the abdomen is expanding, our lumbar spine is following in the same direction. This means that it's moving into a low doses. So it's kind of compressing. At the same time, the glutes are not able to become activated. And at the same time, the deep abdominals are not being able to become activated because the, uh, uh, the, the abdomen is expanding. So that's why I always tell my, 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 my athletes to retract the navel so they are inhibiting this expansion phase while they are contracting the glutes. So we have this combination of a retracted navel and contracted glutes. So that's why they have to isolate their breathing to the upper part of the rib cage or just, just the level above the navel. And that's why I, I think that, 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 that abdominal breathing is a bad thing because then you lose this contraction, you lose this, uh, this core function that we talked about. Okay. And this do you is... use that with, with stretching, breathing techniques, uh, weights, or how, how do you... How do you work to actually get that? Uh... I actually work with a concept of uh, respiratory strength training. So we have all these respiratory muscles. Some are more important than others, such as the diaphragm. Um, and they can be strengthened and they can be weakened. They can, uh, they can have trauma, just like any other muscle. So like with my biceps or my, uh, or my six pack or my uh, glutes or anything else, they function the same way. They're just smaller and they guide our lungs instead of, instead of guiding my elbow, for example. So we have to treat them the same way. So let's say, uh, uh, let's say you can have a trigger point in your shoulder. The same thing you can have in, in, in any of your uh, uh, respiratory muscles, if it's the intercostals and if it's the pectoralis minor or the diaphragm, you can have this trauma, these tensions that you need to release in order for them to work optimally and, and move in broad directions and move the body the way that it's supposed to do. And then you have the strength parts. You can strengthen them to... It means that they can be better at contracting. They can be better at moving our ribs, for example, so that the lungs are able to expand more and uptake more oxygen. Um, an example of, uh, of, of this respiratory strength training is by, for example, adding uh, bands to your uh, thoracic cavity or just isolated to the rib cage so that when you inhale, you are inhaling with, uh, yeah, with resistance. So these muscles that are guiding the rib cage, they, they have resistance and they get stronger, faster. Can I, can I just come in here? Mm -hmm. People might be talking about, when we're talking about respiratory muscle strength and what can lead to causing a weaker diaphragm? Is it going to be specifically when an individual is breathing more in the upper chest that they're not engaging or they don't have as good a recruitment of the diaphragm? And that would be one question. And the second question would be that you're strengthening the diaphragm by adding an extra load onto it to cause resistance, that you're breathing against resistance almost as if you're, you're lifting weights mm -hmm. to help strengthen it and then go into the advantages of it. And what happens if somebody has a weak diaphragm? So I know I've thrown three questions in there. So coming back to the first one, what would cause an athlete to have a weaker diaphragm? Poor breathing, really. And also poor posture because our posture is really influencing the way that we breathe. So if we have very forward flexed, uh, forward hunched shoulders, in general, the thoracic cavity being compressed, then we are unable to expand and open up uh, uh, the way that we want to open up. And that affects uh, the thoracic cavity, the diaphragm, and thereby the lungs. 
So, so posture and poor breathing, and you said it yourself, chest breathing, for example, upper breathing, where we're not able to engage uh, uh, the full spectrum of the lungs, that would be a way as well to, to, to not being able to fully activate the diaphragm because then we don't get to the deeper parts. But also, if we only think about abdominal breathing and talk about abdominal breathing and people misunderstanding to just be barely expanding, um, that's not a sufficient way to, to, uh, to, to engage the diaphragm as well. So from my perspective, at least, I think we need to think, uh, uh, emphasize more ribcage breathing and lateral expansion if we want to really engage the diaphragm the way that we are supposed to. And it's interesting. I've seen I've seen uh, your some of your posts with with top athletes. So you know, it's not because you're a top athlete doesn't necessarily mean you got optimal breathing. Which is, you know, you you look at you know the physicality of a person, and then you you think to have optimal breathing. But I've seen on your post that that and how you describe it, that's definitely not the case. Yeah, sure, sure, and and and, and yeah. What I emphasize the most with my athletes when we talk about uh, optimal breathing, I, I, I always screen them from a physical perspective. So I take pictures of them, these before, after postural pictures. <laughs> and an and, and, and indication for me that they are, they are on the right path is when I can see at their wrist, wristing posture that their ribcage is becoming wider. That's an indication for me that their uh, respiratory capabilities are becoming better. Of course, we're also doing all sorts of, of testings, uh, also the bone skull that I uh, learned from you, Patrick. Um, but from a visual or, or yeah, visual perspective, that's how I screen them. And coming back to then, so strengthening the diaphragm is all about breathing against resistance. Do you think nose breathing is going to play a role there? different devices that people are using. But maybe the first question to, to look at is, why would an athlete bother to strengthen their diaphragm? What happens when you have a weak diaphragm in terms of what goes on there? Yeah, but the diaphragm is, is connected to the lungs, basically. So if we have a weak diaphragm, the end, the end uh, occurrence is that the blood oxygenation will become impaired. So there's a really different stages from a weak diaphragm to uh, uh, impaired blood oxygenation, but that is the end um, dysfunction, if we can say it that way. But also there's, a, there's this myofascial connection uh, in the body. I guess you know a bit about that, but the diaphragm is connected to the tongue to the lungs actually also, and all the way down to our feet. Um, and this means that the way that we move is connected through all these steps. So even a weak diaphragm, it can impair our feet and vice versa. I don't know if that answered your questions. Yeah, but, and there's another one I'm intrigued about is blood stealing. You know, I've, I've only seen it happen kind of a couple of times. You watch a video of an athlete running down the track Mm -hmm. And the next thing is their legs start to go from under them. And you could be wondering, well, what's going on there? Is it, is it a buildup of hydrogen ion that's after causing fatigue? Or is it that they have respiratory muscle fatigue and the body will sacrifice other functions in order to maintain blood flow to the diaphragm? So it steals blood from the legs to feed the diaphragm. Is it something that you've ever came across I think for athletes, because I've read it, I don't know if it was Timothy Noakes, you know, Dr. Timothy Noakes, the South African physiologist, he wrote the book, is it the lore of running, but he said up to 50% of athletes have diaphragmatic fatigue. Like Mads, when we hear a figure like this, up mm -hmm. to 50% of athletes have diaphragm fatigue, I'm not sure if it's as high as that, but I think anybody would be questioning blood stealing, you know, and we have to think about breathing as being the, it's a really important function, probably the most vital function in the human body. And the body is going to sacrifice other functions in order to maintain breathing. Mm -hmm. So it kind of plays in with that. You know, that's why I, I suppose with... Yeah, well, uh, I haven't, I haven't 
uh, studied that too much. So I don't know a lot about it, but it makes sense to me. But the body compensates at all kinds of of stuff. So so yeah, that makes sense. It's a compensational pattern. Yeah, and I think when athletes then kind of realize this, that this is a potential for half the. In, in terms, just coming back to the both score, like we use this, we know it's not perfect. We know it gives you an indicator. Do you see a correlation? Because mm-hmm. you're looking at it, see, with Daniel and myself, our emphasis, we're not hands-on. Mm, we look sure. at breathing from, from a number of different dimensions, but we don't have the tools then to actually do a dive from release or anything like that. So mm-hmm. all of that stuff is outside of our scope. And this is why it's very interesting to have this this sure. conversation and it just goes to show that breathing is not so simple either it's it's no. pretty com- it's pretty complex you we're using the boat score and yes we're looking to see and we see there's a connection between upper chest breathing good recruitment of the diaphragm faster breathing slower breathing tidal volume effort pauses etc what sort of connection do you see with individuals with poor respiratory muscle strength and the boat score do you see a correlation there Yeah, absolutely. And, and th- that's also why I keep doing the boat score because I find it highly reliable. So yeah, I see a correlation between the initial testings and screenings that I do of the respiratory system and to the boat score. Mm, the only issue that there is about the boat score is the athlete's inability to, to know when to uh, start breathing again because they are not so conscious about their own bodies to know what the first sign of uh, yeah of wanting to breathe again is so maybe i'm a bad teacher on that part or maybe they're just uh, uh, not conscious about their own body enough no, no not at all that's that's a normal feature sometimes what we do is say for example if an athlete has a boat score of 20 seconds mm-hmm. And we pay attention to their breathing at the end, and we're hoping that their breathing at the end is pretty normal. But if their boat score is 20 seconds, but if we're not sure, we could have them do a maximum pause, and it should be doubled. So the maximum pause should be 40. And another way then to test it, if you want to go a little bit deeper, is have them hold their breath for 17 seconds Mm -hmm. and see how are they breathing. Is there room for holding their breath for longer? And then have them hold their breath for maybe 23 seconds and see uh, when they resume breathing at 23 seconds, do they have slightly labored breathing? So if you see slightly labored breathing at 23 seconds, well, you know then it's gone too far at 23. Mm-hmm. If at 17, if you know there's some room for improvement, so you probably think, okay, well, 20 is about right. And it's not about getting it perfect, I suppose. This is about just kind of getting your baseline yeah and working to gently improve it over a period of time so yeah that's that's interesting no it's uh it's kind of normal I'd, I'd say to people don't get hung up about the ball score sometimes no. people they get stressed about it because they feel mm-hmm. that it's stubborn and it's influenced by so many things you know so that's why it's important yeah daniel well, I, I just w- w- going back to our conversation here that it's complex. Where where do you normally start, Mas, when you when you get somebody coming in? Because we're talked about breathing, and you know, uh, physiology, and and when you come to breathing, where do you start? Uh, do you start with the biomechanics, uh, uh, biochemical, slow breathing, or is it always tailor made? Because there's so it's so many things you can do that you have like a, a standard approach to kind of evaluate. It is very tailor-made because uh, it all comes down to that posture. I don't, I, I don't look at a client and, 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 and say, how is your breathing? And then we, and then we uh, make up the training according to your breathing. I look at that posture and then we create the training according to that posture, also with the breathing approach. So there's no one size fits all in terms of that, but in general, it is about the diaphragm and rib cage expansion of diaphragm function and, and rib cage expansion. That's pretty much a, a perspective that I'm working on kind of mm. all clients with. Mm. I, I, a question, I have, actually I have two examples. Like I am an old tennis player and tennis players tend to have hunched over like this, a lot of tennis players. 
And if you look at football players, they, they tend to have a big problem squatting because either their uh, hip flexor or more the, their ankles. So if you take those two sports, in general, somebody from, from tennis, they usually are, are hunched over. What, what would you start with somebody who's like, one is up here, one is down there with the, with the, the ankles and the, the hip flexors? Is there anything you could say about that? Yeah, well, my approach is always to release trauma. And uh, trauma is really a dehydrated tissues. So we want to re, uh, rehydrate tissues to induce, to induce better movement and glide and, and thereby functionality. So uh, that is really the first thing I do with all, uh, all, all individuals. So if it's a, it's a football player that has uh, hip, uh, hip problems, not able to, to flex or, or bend down, then we have to release these restrictions. If it's with stretching or, or corrective movement or it's, it's releasing these trauma. And if it's the tennis players that, uh, that has uh, hunched forward shoulders, then we need to release the trauma that is probably on the anterior side of the, of the body in muscles that are also respiratory muscles. So kind of a big deal. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because th those are things that, that I know. So I'm just generalizing. Of course, yeah, you can have the, the opposite. But I've, uh, but, I've, but I've seen from your some of your posts as well that top athletes, they, they have these problems. So they're, they have, you know, functional movement problems, some. Uh, yeah, and it all comes down to postural problems. Hmm. So postural pro problems are uh, uh, affecting both our movement, but also our breathing. So it's all... It's all the same picture, really, but different spots in the picture. Yeah. Mads, would you consider trauma as being one of the biggest factors in causing dysfunctional breathing? And the second one is you talked about dehydration of the of the muscles. Um, can you just go a little bit deeper? Because maybe if somebody hears about dehydration, they're thinking to themselves, well, the solution there is to drink more water. So just uh, what's your take on it? Well, dehydration is not just about uh, water intake because you can drink as much water as you'd like, but if your, if your tissues are impaired, then the water will not get into those tissues. Um, and that can come from a different of variables such as uh, inactivity or poor activity, uh, injury, anything like that that, that causes these dehydrating areas of the body where the where the uh, where the water is not no longer able to get into the tissues so the tissues will be stuck like this and they're no longer able to glide that is what's causing postural dysfunction or movement dysfunction pain uh, 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 inflammation all that stuff so how to release that we can become better movers. We can move more functionally, move more in the three-dimensional uh, three plane, more multidimensional. Or we can do therapy to rehydrate these areas. And that therapy is mostly compression. So when we apply compression to a dehydrated area, it's like uh, putting a, a sponge, sponge in a bowl of uh, water and then pressing the sponge, it will uh, attracts the water into the sponge. That's what happens when we compress that area. So that's why we go to massage or any kind of therapy. And that's why it works actually. So when we do that repeatedly over time, we re rehydrate these areas so that we become better movers. And that's the same with the respiratory muscles. And the first day, the question of, I'm intrigued by trauma because sometimes my people might be thinking, well, trauma is something that it's when you're exposed to a really severe stressor in your life, but could it be something that's a chronic stress, but of a milder, a milder intensity? But so when you talk about trauma, what do you, what do you mean? Yeah. Like trauma can be physical activity, but it can also be something mental depression or something that we experienced earlier in life. And that's because our mental state is often uh, um, connected to the physical state. Because when we experience something traumatic, some parts of our body is, uh, is reacting by contraction. 
So when we experience this exaggerated traumatic uh, events, this part of the body will be locked in the contraction. So that's kind of the, of the mental aspect of creating trauma. So it's almost that you're implying that the main muscle that's locked there is going to be the diaphragm because of trauma. The diaphragm then isn't able to move back up to its resting position. So would you think that breathing is the main organ or the main, the main function that trauma is going to, to impact? Yeah, it could be. It could be. I actually... I actually, I'm actually not sure about that, but I, but but I believe that breathing is 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 making the biggest impact. So whether the diaphragm or the respiratory muscles are those that are being uh, uh, affected the most, I don't know, but I know that they make the biggest impact in terms of trauma in the body. So when you release the diaphragm, and when you improve breathing, it, what you're saying is that when we fix breathing, it helps trauma quite significantly. Mm -hmm. okay Absolutely. so that's where the connection is yeah but 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 we cannot relieve all trauma in the body by fixing our breathing sure but, but it certainly helps sure sure i would agree this is the thing about the human body it's 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 so complex you know and i you know and i think the, probably the whole model of western medicine when it looks at the human body as separate parts and nobody seems yeah. to be connecting what one function is having on the other. Like we've been talking about breathing and movement, and then we can talk about breathing and sleep. And you could talk about sleep and movement. You know, there's going yeah. to be so many different connections there that you, you that ties in, but that makes it interesting. But then it can be a little bit off-putting because somebody listening might think, Jesus, I have to be doing this and that and the others, and I have 20 different things to be doing in order to, to make progress. And that might be a question as well. Like if you're working with somebody and you're looking at their, you're looking at their diet, you're looking at their movement, you're looking at their sleep, you're looking at everything. And I know it, they're all valid, but how does a person make that journey? And I know Daniel was bringing it on earlier on and he'll be asking questions about habits, but when there's so much stuff, could it be a little bit overwhelming for somebody? How would they start? Where would they begin? We have to re remember that it's because we have deviated so much from who we really are that it can seem like a complex thing because it's not that we have to uh, improve and do so many special or, or, or crazy things. It's just that we are so dysfunctional. We are so far away from who we are designed to be that we have to find back to these things. So... Uh, so yeah, I can understand that people feel that way, but they also need to understand that it's not something special that they need to do. It's, it's about finding back to who they really are. So it's something that they have to do unless they want to die of disease or be impaired for the rest of their lives. So that's our, 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 our job as a human being, really. And could it be a case of just saying, okay, well... I'm just going to focus on one thing at this point and work gently with that and improve it and bring it into my way of life and feel the benefits of it. And then after a period of time, maybe you think, okay, there's a connection here. I start looking at this. And yeah. I think this is, you know, I think this is going to be an issue that's facing us all. How do we get people to, to bring this into their way of life? How do we get them? Because Ultimately, the effectiveness of something is only as good as the person is going to put it into practice. You know, sometimes less is better. Um, and I know, Daniel, you're taking it in terms of creating habits. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the problem is that most people, you know, they wake up, they drive to work, they sit still all day, they drive back home, they're on the couch. It, it becomes normal, but it's not normal for, for functional movement. And then that impairs breathing or vice versa. And then you eat a certain diet and then that goes on and on and on over many years. It's, it's uh, hidden in plain sight, so to speak. So yeah. some people don't want to give up that to have something else because they don't even know what that is. So it becomes almost like a, a sacrifice. So they, they may train or eat something 
just because they want the results, but they don't really enjoy that that process. So it's a short, it's it's always almost short lived for a few weeks, few months. It's it seems it's like an obstacle. It's not sustainable. It's not a sustainable mm -hmm. platform. And that's it's it's the knee jerk reactions and almost what happens if somebody has a poor breeding uh, pattern. If they get back to it, they stop. If you lose, if you overweight, you when you get back to the weight, you stop. And it goes on and on and on. So I'm very interested in building those sustainable habits, getting into daily life. And I don't think there's an exact blueprint, but uh, I think starting small is is normally the way I approach it. Kind of like what you said, Patrick, to see some sort of development and then move step by step. But like with your approach, knowing that there is, you know, you have to think about your movement. You have to think about your diet, have to think about your sleep. That, it's not just one thing because otherwise, if you have poor sleeping uh, habits, that will affect your daytime. So at least you're it's it's about awareness first, then habits. That's how I that's how I look at it. But it it is uh, difficult. Yeah, it is difficult. But we have to think about good habits the same way that we think about bad habits. They are all created the same way. So so if you want to create a good habit, you have to create it the same way that you created the bad habits. It takes time and you have to create one habit at a time. Um, but that's how it is. For some people, uh, it varies how long we are, we are about the, uh, creating this habit. Some can be two or three days about it. Some can be two months about creating a habit. But it all comes down to the habits. Um, yeah, sorry, I just deviated from what you say. Yeah, yeah no, but, but I, I think, no, I think I, it's, yeah. I think it's correct, but it's kind of when you're working with your clients then, because we've had these challenges as well. And part of it was we would be working, say, with a client, we might be working on a Tuesday and we'd have them then again, maybe a week later, the following Tuesday. Mm -hmm. But they'd be fine. So Tuesday, they're putting it into practice. Wednesday, they're putting it into practice. And Thursday, life has got in the way and practice has gone out the window. Mm -hmm. So... It's, it's about then, you know, as, as a, almost as an instructor, how often do you feel, how would you motivate your typical client? I know I understand probably this isn't relevant to the listenership, but I just think it's interesting. I think it's important for the, the individual who's expected to put into practice what's expected of them. But from our point of view, what can we do also to help to, to gear that up a bit? Do you contact them frequently? Do you get them to fill out charts? Do you stay on top of them? Do you hold their hand? Do you push them? Do you are you nice about it? Are you not nice about it? It's like, what's the best approach? You do you think? I don't feel responsible for being their parent. I guess other coaches and teachers uh, do that, but but not me because I know what it feels like to be disciplined. Um, to, to create structures and habits. I know the importance of it and I know that it's not easy, but if I'm capable of it, everybody else, because I'm, I'm, I'm not special. So I, I require from my, from my clients that they can do the same. So I in, inform them and teach them to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. But then I expect that they're grown up uh, uh, adults like I am with responsibilities for their own lives so i kind of pace them but i don't want to be their parents because i have mm. a life as well sure. but, but yeah i have big e expectations for them and mm. it all comes down to structure and habits if you don't have structure and habits life will become very hard and complicated mm. i think i think it's uh, one thing that i forgot to mention is that a lot of these things, the habits are subconscious, like, and or, or you're not you're not conscious of them during the day, like the way you breathe at work or in a, in, a, in a physical activity at rest, and even what sometimes what you eat, but also at night how you breathe. So you may not even be conscious of your poor habits. So, so one thing is if you're aware of them, then you can kind of you have a choice. Uh, and food is easier because most people have a decent idea, okay, bad or good. But when it comes to breathing and posture, it develops slowly over such a long time that you're not even aware of it. So 
I think, again, the first step is you have to become aware. aware then you have yeah. to uh, form the, the new habits. And those are always difficult. What, what's, your, what's your take on that? Because people come to you, they, they're aware to some degree, at least. Yeah, but I totally agree with you here. First step is awareness. So we have to make awareness. We have to tell clients or the people what they're doing wrong. When they know what they're doing wrong, they're asking for, for help. They're asking for guidance. Then what can I do? And then it's our job to say, you can do this, 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 and this. So you have to start by incorporating this. Then you can incorporate this and sort of make a journey out of it, a developmental journey. So completely agree with you here. Awareness becomes, uh, becomes learning. Uh, and, and, and what makes the learning is the habits and the structure in between. Mm. And uh, following up on that, as the next step, creating, uh, creating uh, habits, I know you had a few articles uh, that you published like, uh, or that you had on your, on your um, uh, website as far as also mind over matter. That again, going back to what I said earlier, that if you're just doing it for the end result, and you know you don't have that you have to enjoy training i think you have to maybe yeah. enjoy the food because if you always see it as a as a punishment to eat the, the food or to do the exercise i think for most people or almost every every person unless you're extremely disciplined it will fail eventually so you're kind of so how do you how do you work with making something like whatever it may be uh if possible fun and, and motivating Yeah, like you say, that is the most important of everything. All aspects of health. We cannot induce better health if it's not enjoyable uh, and fun and if we don't smile while we do it. Hmm. So, so that is a core component of me. When Whatever I do, I tell people, enjoy what you do. If you don't enjoy it, it can be yeah, so healthy, but you won't get the benefits. So, so and, and that's also in terms of breathing and physical training, nutrition, if we don't enjoy what we do, if our clients don't like us or they don't like what we teach them, then it's not healthy. Then it's not inducing better health. And science is beginning to create studies on this. I think they've been doing this for the past few years. So it's very new. We've always uh, been speculating about this mind over matter thing. Uh, we know about the placebo effect uh, uh, and, and, and what it can do to the body. But now science is really uh, creating groundbreaking studies on how influential the mind really is. So, and, 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 and we, uh, we are able to see physiological responses based on what the mind believes. So even though we have a physical object, that is what it is. Two different people seeing it at, as two diametrical different things mm. are reacting to it physiologically different. So it's, 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 it's a really big deal here. Whatever we do, enjoy it. So if, you, if you're doing something that is not perfectly healthy, but you're very happy about it, you're very happy about those three cups of coffee or that cigarettes. And then we have the guy who's working out every day or eating a diet plan, something like that. And he hates it. He hates it with all his heart. Then what is best? Mm. I think this one is best. Mm. Yeah, very, very interesting. <laughs> that, yeah, we, myself and Patrick had a lot of discussions with that because you have people who don't want to work out or do exercises and, and so on. So how, how do you... How do you motivate them? One, one may be, I don't know if you work with uh, goal setting, for example, to, to kind of, that could be one way. There are many ways, but one, one area that we, that we haven't really touched on, we talked a lot about the daytime, but sleep. And mm -hmm. uh, most people don't necessarily think about, it. it's not so much you can do during sleep, but how do you, what do you, how do you work with sleep? Like, what are you supposed to do daytime and nighttime? So once again, awareness. Uh, when I talk to my family and my friends about this, no one has any idea of what I'm talking about. So that's maybe the biggest problem. If we don't know about our circadian rhythm, we are, we are screwed in terms of our sleep because everything is governed by the circadian rhythm. And the circadian rhythm is being influenced by factors such as, as light, temperature, nutrition, etc. 
um, and, and, and how we are exposed to these different uh, factors is determining how well we sleep or, or how well we are functioning during the day. So if we take light, for example, the circadian rhythm is a, is a thing in our brain called the supercharismatic nucleus that is responding to all these components. So when our eyes are receiving light, it sends signals to this structure in our, in our brain to release hormones that are connected to wakefulness. So they know that when light is coming in, we need to be more awake. So they are inducing uh, 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 or producing hormones that are making us feeling, uh, feel more awake. The same way that the absence of light or darkness signals into, uh, into this biological clock that the pineal gland should produce melatonin, which is what makes us feel sleepy. So if we, if, we, if we don't respect these different things and we, uh, and, and we don't get exposed to light in the morning because it's completely dark, dark and we don't go outside, it takes many hours for us to feel awake from when we wake up. Oppositely and, 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 and most commonly, for example, is when, uh, when the sun sets and we turn on the indoor lights, we turn on the television, the phone and we get all these sorts of light exposure when it's actually nighttime then the pineal gland is becoming impaired in uh, in producing melatonin so it's actually only at the moment that we shut our eyes that melatonin production starts which should have been started hours earlier and that's the same with temperature with uh, with cold exposure with excessive heat uh, with nutrition that, that changes the metabolic rate and so on. So we need to become aware of these things, how we're influenced by them in order to create better sleep. Mm. Yeah, and, all, and also I think one very big uh, key thing is also when you do all these things as uh, TV, uh, phones and all, all these things that you said, it creates distractions and distractions removes focus and then affects your breathing, which will affect your sleep. So again, it, 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 it comes from various ways. So I, I think uh, one key thing is actually remove distractions for better sleep. It's become, it's become a habit of becoming uh, focused on distractions. And then you, you bring that into the night. So I, I think that it's, it's, it's quite a complicated area again, because where do you start? Do you start with temperature? Do you start with uh, uh, no blue lights? Uh, do you start with uh, focus on breathing, removing stuff? It's again, coming back to habits. Where do you, and since no person is the same, where do you get the biggest bang for your buck? Because there's so many things to kind of focus on. Do you have any, any type of suggestions of kind of like uh, where, where do you start? Because it is from many, many places where you, uh, that affects your sleep. Yeah, but I, I actually think that, that sleep is very simple. And if we, if we need to make it as simple as possible, we have to talk about the light because just a second. I'm oh, sorry, some, someone is knocking on my door. Okay, <laughs> go on. Um, uh, yeah, so light means wakefulness. Darkness means sleepiness. Okay, so when we want to feel awake, then we go outside and get sun exposure. When we want to become tired and feel sleepy, make sure that there's absence of light. That is rule number one. That's pretty simple, right? Go out and get sun exposure. Then you also get the vitamin D and, and, and all the effects of the sun. Um, and then, of course, habits. Make sure that you uh, go to sleep and wake up within 50, 30 minutes, but at the same time, uh, uh, every night monday to sunday you cannot just uh, sleep in at the weekends it has to be the same every night because then your circadian rhythm functions uh, perfectly in terms of all the functions that it do in our body so so yeah that that, that leads me to uh, i have a final question about then where you live uh, if you live in copenhagen denmark or on the equator yeah. Yeah. Has, has a big effect because mm -hmm. because also coming back to habits because if you're in in Copenhagen or even further north in the summer 
it will be bright light at 10 o'clock almost at night and you're supposed to be at bed versus if you're on the equator it's dark around whatever six o'clock 6 30 so that makes it in, in practice very difficult to have the same for two certain two uh, persons to have the exact same regiment no because when you know of the importance about light you can manipulate it of course indoor light is will never be as good as sunlight period mm -hmm. but it's better to get indoor light in the morning when it's dark outside if you want to become refreshed instead mm -hmm. of just staying uh, uh, in the darkness as well as when the sun sets here in copenhagen at 4 p.m during the winter it sure mm -hmm. as hell is better to just turn on the indoor lights instead of just uh, okay. uh, yeah following that that pattern so we can manipulate things to become more refreshed or sleepy even if the seasons are, are changing okay oh, interesting something i just uh, thought of uh patrick yeah. any, anything uh else no, i think it's been a i think it's been a fascinating conversation um we've covered a lot of ground and i'm just conscious of uh, mad's time as well in terms of i suppose one question that i'm niggling a little bit about um you work with athletes predominantly you measure their both scores what kind of bolt scores do you typically see? What ranges? What's the most common bolt score? And are these recreational athletes or are they professional athletes? Or what about that? They are prim primarily professional athletes. And, and, and most of them are actually some of the best in the world in the sports they are performing. So it's, it's kind of incredible that their bolt, score, bolt scores are like in the, in the start 20s mostly. I have a few guys who are around 30 plus minus, but primarily it's, yeah, 21, 22, maybe 23. And do you ever see guys with lower boat scores, 12, 13 seconds, especially those that might have dysfunctional breathing and experience hyperventilation or exercise induced bronchoconstriction? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I also see the biggest impacts uh, in our training progress on those that have the lowest bowl score. And that's why I keep using it because I find it highly reliable in terms of the progression that I see. And it's simple. And it's simple. It's yeah. simple. Because that's, it. like, that's the thing about breathing. If you, were to, if you were to really assess somebody's breathing patterns, you'd want to be measuring their entitled CO2, doing the high load test, and I'm making questionnaires yeah and it would be too time consuming yeah whereas a simple breath hold time is giving you that's it's a very simple technique to assess for functional or dysfunctional breathing um Maz, i think it's been a very good conversation and uh final words i'll leave to uh daniel and yourself i just have yeah i remember i had I have to ask them do you use any measuring devices such as even biometric devices the uh, whoop strap or a ring or whatever whatever it may be for you can do it for various reasons or track anything specifically nothing at all i have been doing that a lot i've been very dedicated to all kinds of devices and tools and equipment but but i don't find it necessary i i i, I see it as we become we become distracted and deviated from from feeling what we feel Mm -hmm. So I've had all these kind of uh, sleep devices and test devices for my players, both in terms of the, the respiration, but also their physical training. But some of it is good, but I find in general that it distracts us from feeling uh, and, and going inside our body. For example, sleep. When I wake up in the morning, I know whether I had a good sleep or a bad sleep. There's no watch or aura ring that can that can tell me that maybe it can give me some some data some 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 numbers on on my sleep, but I know whether I had a good or a, a bad sleep, and I won't know what to do. So it can be beneficial to to some people, but I also think that it's important to go inside our bodies sometimes. Yep. Yep. I would. I'm going to step. Back. I would absolutely agree with that. I think it's so important. Um. You know, it's and it, the lack of awareness out there is really fundamental. I think it's increasing because of the reliance on technology. You know, we're bringing out a new app in the mm -hmm. next month or two. And um, I don't think an app is ever going to replace an instructor, though. You know, in terms of that human face to face, you can be doing a certain technique by an app or you have guidance by an instructor. But at the same time, the way we're looking at it is that 
you have the instructor working with the client. And then when the client is at home, they can tap into the app as a support of what the instructor was doing. So that's the idea behind it. Um, I think technology can be a support. Yeah, and it's able to help more people than an instructor can do. And you can yeah. go worldwide. So I fully support that idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure, Mads, from Copenhagen and your book. How do people find out about you? Where, where do they buy your book? Uh, What's the name my, of it? What's the name of your book? My book is uh, called Human Mechanics, and you can find it on, uh, on Amazon worldwide. Um, and I am having my platform primarily on Instagram, MT Performance DK, where I'm sharing all sorts of uh, health information and, and, yeah, most of the stuff that we talked about today. Great and, stuff. Yeah, and I also think we have to remember to tell people that breathing correctly is easy. It's nothing complicated. So it's, it's really about breathing deeply, breathing slowly, taking fewer breaths per minute, but making sure that those breaths are good enough so that we're able to exercise the diaphragm to a sufficient degree. It's, it's not yeah. more complicated than that. It is. I would agree. It's a balance, isn't it? It is. It's, it's, it's nose breathing. It's the bio breathing from a biochemical point of view, the biomechanical point of view, and looking at the frequency of breathing. And it's the power of this, Mads. You can change your physiology by changing your breathing. You know all of this. This is where we need to get breathing out there because I can only think of the amount of individuals who have no control over their physiology, even from a mental health point of view. Absolutely. And from a performance point of view, and this is where breathing is going to, to really play a role. I see a great future in breathing, to be honest with you. Um, it took, you know, I've been in this and Daniel quite a few years and it was kind of slow for the first 15 years, 16 years. And the last few years, it's really taken up. Do you see your athletes? Are they kind of open to it or do they kind of do the eyes glaze over? That's, that was the usual response I used to get when I talked about breathing. Oh, no, here's another another guru not that i'm a guru actor like that but uh do you find is there a bit of an interest now with the athletes how do they take it i think that my clients or my athletes like me better when i introduced breathing into the practice so it's really been been an interesting perspective both in terms of what i can see on their progress and their bodies but also in terms of their interest for our training together so Absolutely. And I think that's also why it's been so popular and why it's the future yeah. of human movement. I would and, agree. It's not, and it's not this, uh, this uh, special fancy thing. It's just breathing, you know, so it's, it's a human quality that we need to respect. That's it. Thank you very much, Mads. Thank you, Thank Daniel. You. Thank you. Take care, guys. Pleasure, guys.